Has the coronavirus already found a way to beat the vaccines? A mutation in minks has led to mass culling in Denmark. The new strain doesn't appear any deadlier to humans, but it does raise serious questions. What we have to evaluate over time is whether that virus has any difference in transmission or clinical severity, or whether there's any implication for diagnostics of vaccines. But we're a long, long way away from making any determination of that kind. The reason for concern is the mutations have occurred in the virus's spike protein. That's the very target of the most developed vaccines. Officials have since discovered the coronavirus on mink farms in half a dozen countries. But the biggest producer, Denmark, is hardest hit. And it's become political, with the agriculture minister stepping down after the government admitted it didn't have the legal basis to order the nationwide culling. There are more than 1,300 mink farms in Denmark. Many of them are in the municipality of Jochum, including Bjarne Petersen's. The virus reached his farm in early September. He clearly remembers that day. It was like a wave passing through the stables. It began at one end with the animals sneezing and losing their appetite, and it kept spreading. But one week later, on the following weekend, it was over. The animals were healthy again. Bjarne Pedersen also contracted the virus. Now, to be on the safe side, all of his 10,000 mink will be culled. He never imagined that Denmark's mink farms could develop into hotspots. It is thought that the coronavirus stems from the animal world. It is believed to have first jumped from a bat species to humans via the pangolin in China. On Denmark's mink farms, it is now jumping back to animals from humans. Once a mink is infected, the virus spreads to almost all of the animals on a farm in less than two weeks. Virologists are concerned about this extensive transmission. Anders Fromsgaard's team analyzed the mutation on the mink farms and found it matched the virus found in some people in the region who fell ill. We can see exactly how the virus spreads. It comes from humans, it is transmitted to minks, where it spreads en masse and mutates in a manner we don't see in humans. And then it jumps back to the human population and thus to the rest of the world. Every third corona case in northern Jutland can already be traced back to the mink farms. Exactly how it spread is still unclear. But with ever more mutations in circulation, especially those from animals, the pandemic will become difficult to stop. A vaccine could lose its effectiveness. And the people who have been ill might not be immune to the mutation. So we would never achieve herd immunity. And that is why culling task forces are now rapidly traveling through Denmark. The animals are killed with carbon monoxide in boxes like this one. They are then immediately incinerated, along with their valuable fur. Protective gear is mandatory, as any animal might be infected. We have to kill 39,000 minks on this farm. We'll be busy for two and a half days. We have 30 workers, five vets, and a standby team of five to ten men here. They will need at least another four weeks to work their way to all the farms. A total of 160 farms are affected, and there are suspicious cases on many more. Millions of minks have yet to be culled. Peter Ben Mbarak is an expert in food safety and zoonoses at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Could you explain to us, first of all, what's actually going on in the minks? How is the virus mutating? What happens is that we uh, put in the mink population a uh, human virus, and that's our COVID-19 virus. And of course, this virus, this human virus, has now to adapt to the mink environment, and therefore, true mutation when jumping from one mink to the next in these big mink farms, it mutates and try to adapt to the new environments. And that's what we are seeing each time we have the virus in a mink farm and allowed to spread from one mink to the mink over a period of time.
OK, well, the question is, could these mutations, uh, which occur in the spike proteins, which are used to enter a host cell and are also targeted by most of the promising vaccines that are in development, undermine the progress that we've made on a vaccine? That's very difficult to, uh, to say because these mutations are difficult to predict. And uh, what we have seen so far um, are, not, uh, are not dramatic. We've seen one, the, the famous cluster fine uh, variant in Denmark, uh, and initial studies would tend to indicate that it uh, it's would be less sensible, uh, uh, sensitive to uh, uh, potentially to a vaccine, but that's early days and we need much more studies to uh, to get better understanding of that. But what worries us is the potential for uh, another mutation, another variant uh, that has not yet uh, appeared, uh, and that would be much more problematic with regards to uh, a vaccine or would be more uh, uh, lethal uh, or easier to transmit between humans. So it's the potential for one day, one mutation coming up that is not a nice one. And, and, and that not-so-nice mutation, could that occur in any other animal? Uh, yes, it could occur uh, in any, uh, anywhere where the virus is allowed and uh, attempt to mutate uh, when it's jumping from one individual to an, another individual. And that's more likely to happen in an uh, animal uh, population than uh, while it continues to circulate between humans. And more likely to happen in minks or, or cows, goats, sheep? It doesn't, from initial studies, it doesn't, the virus doesn't seem to be infecting uh, cattle or pigs uh, or sheep uh, easily. Uh, if, it, if it can, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's not at all, at all adapted to these uh, animals. Uh, and therefore, jumping from one cow to the next or one pig to the next will be a difficult uh, process and then most likely the virus will, will, will die off and not, and not manage that jump. While in the mink population, it seems to be very well transmissible between minks and therefore it has this opportunity to jump quickly between one mink to the next in these big farms again and each time it has an opportunity to, to mutate. So there it's much more likely to happen than in other animal species where it's not likely to, to, uh, to infect these animals or to transmit between animals. But why is that happening? What, what is it about the minks? Uh, the minks seems to have um, um, uh, cells in their, in their respiratory tracts, in their lungs, uh, that are very similar to, uh, to the human ones, and therefore the, the virus has already an easy uh, way to, uh, to, uh, to enter uh, a mink respiratory uh, cell. And uh, we use uh, ferrets, we use uh, them uh, uh, very regularly as model animals when we test uh, uh, coronaviruses in general. So it's not surprising that, uh, that mink has this uh, natural affinity and susceptibility to the virus. So is this the right approach, killing all those minks? It seems to be the logical approach uh, because the only way to avoid that is to either protect the minks from uh, the virus, meaning protecting the farms so the virus doesn't infect all these farms, or protecting the humans who are working on these farms. And uh, what we have seen in the past months is that this seems to be very difficult or uh, perhaps impossible. Uh, and therefore, the only logical solution is to uh, remove the minks. Peter Barak from the WHO, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, could dogs spread COVID-19? A study by the University of Granada and the Andalusian School of Public Health shows living with a canine can increase the risk of getting the virus. The authors warned dog owners to take extreme hygiene measures with their pets, as it's not yet clear whether owners were infected by the animal or from taking it out for a walk in public. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams, now. He's been looking into your questions on the coronavirus. How long does immunity last once the disease is overcome? Straight off the bat, um, no one can really answer this at this point. But that doesn't mean that it isn't worth 
talking about. Um, this is really a key question, especially with vaccine approvals, apparently just around the corner, um, because immunity in people who got the disease will also sort of set the goalposts with the immunity that we can expect a vaccine to provoke. Um, although the two aren't necessarily tied really closely to one another, knowing about one will at least allow us to make a stab at guessing the other. So this is what we know so far about immunity in people who've recovered from COVID-19. We're over 10 months in, and, and so far, as far as we can tell, very few people have gotten it a second time, um, just, just a handful. So, so that's positive. It indicates average immunity could last uh, at least a year, as long as with other coronaviruses uh, that are, are less deadly, uh, possibly even two or longer, which was the guesstimate for, for SARS. There have been worrisome results from studies that show levels of antibodies falling in people who recovered from COVID-19 um, just a few months later. But most experts say you shouldn't focus on that because that's to be expected. Um, we focus on antibodies so much because they're one of the easiest markers for us to measure. But there are many other aspects to an effective immune response. Um, ultimately, for societies at least, the million dollar question isn't really how long an individual is immune after catching the disease. Um, it'll be how long immunity lasts after people get vaccinated. That's what will determine whether or not we reach herd immunity. Only then will the pandemic end.